Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I'm delighted to have with me my colleague, Dr. Joe Duraney, professor of surgery and the president of the American Thoracic Society of Cardiovascular Surgeons. And today we're going to talk about the ROS procedure from baby to adult. Joe, welcome. Great to see you. It's great to be here. So first, um, before we jump into what the uh, ROS procedure is, what, at a, at a, in the technical sense, at a high level, who needs it? And what are the indications for it? Well, the ROS procedure is a form of aortic valve, uh, aortic valve replacement. And um, it, uh, the, the, the title from you know, children all the way to adults is, is relevant because there really are no good aortic valve replacement choices in children. So the Ross procedure has been sort of the mainstay of aortic valve replacement in children. And simply stated, the Ross procedure is taking the patient's native pulmonary valve, moving it over into the aortic position, and then replacing the pulmonary valve with a pulmonary homograft, typically cryopreserved in the United States from another human. And um, the results of this procedure have really um, have really been superb to the point that the the upper age limit keeps getting higher and higher and higher and higher and now it's it's being performed with some regularity in young to middle-aged adults and so that's sort of the background how long does this operation last I mean you're putting a valve in a position in which it was not designed if yeah. you will to be put in and you do obviously have an, uh, an artificial valve in the pulmonary position. What are the right. durability findings? The durability is actually quite good, ironically. Um, in children, um, it works very well. We don't have the ability to do reinforcement procedures with the what we call the autograph. That's the label that it becomes when it's moved into the aortic position because you don't want to compromise growth uh, potential. Um, and so the autograph can become aneurysmal with time, but typically it's not until the adult years. The pulmonary homograft is actually probably the valve that comes to an intervention first for usually a combination of narrow, you know, stenosis and regurgitation. However, when we get into patients where they've completed growth, we then have reinforcement maneuvers that we can apply to the autograft to keep it from dilating. And, and that's where you know, the real advantage comes in because then that autograft can last literally for decades and decades. And... One important little fact that I think many um, cardiologists, you know, may not appreciate is that if you look at aortic valve replacement in young adults, bioprosthetic valves, mechanical valves, and the Ross procedure, no matter how you look at the literature, the Ross procedure has superior late survival compared to every other valve on the market. And that's why this discussion is so important, uh, because there's this desire to avoid, you know, Coumadin therapy and avoid, you know, mechanical valves with this, you know, sort of unbridled enthusiasm for bioprosthetic valves. But actually, in a young adult, you know, the Ross procedure statistically is, is going to be the valve that's going to provide the best long-term outlook for a patient in their 20s, 30s, and 40s um, compared to a bioprosthetic valve. Now, what about the medical management after the Ross procedure? Um, aspirin, anticoagulation for any duration of time, how do you typically manage them? Just aspirin. There's no anticoagulation at all. Aspirin is, is used you know, for the first few months, but it's actually not needed in the long term. Some people feel that with the homograph, some low-grade anti-inflammatory thing in the background may be helpful, but there's no real hard evidence that that's essential. No. So that's the that's the advantage. There's no medical therapy except I should say good blood pressure control for the first year. Very very good blood pressure control for the first year after which antihypertensive medicines can be, you know, can be uh, stopped. And then you mentioned the most common mode of failure relates to the pulmonic valve. Is that can that then be treated percutaneously if there is a problem? What's the most common approach there? Yes, it can. That's the most common approach, percutaneous. Although it does require um, a, a proper cardiac catheterization to make sure that the left coronary artery is not going to be compromised, because that is one of the potential downsides of the pulmonary homograft following the ROS. Is that homograft really hugs the left coronary artery, and so temporary 
balloon inflation of the homograft with a coronary angiogram to make sure the left coronary is not compromised needs to be done first. And if there's no problem, yes, absolutely, it can be treated percutaneously. So you mentioned the strengths of the procedure. Do all surgeons perform the Ross procedure? No, most congenital surgeons will perform it because, of course, that's what we do in children. Um, and so many um, Ross procedures in the adult are performed by congenital surgeons, although there is a small list of adult cardiac surgeons that have expressed an interest and have developed a level of expertise you know, with the Ross procedure. So I would say most congenital surgeons and selected adult surgeons. And then... Um... You had mentioned that because of its durability and increasing use in older and older populations, should it be offered for an AVR in adults? And what's the oldest patient that you have done a Ross procedure in? Yeah, the oldest I've done it in is in their 50s. Um, when you go to Europe, you know, the, you're in Europe, they they do it in patients in their, in their 60s. Um, 70s may be pushing the envelope a little bit, but I think for me right now, you know, I usually use about 50 years of age as a rough cutoff, although if there's somebody between 50 and 60 who's very athletic, who's in good medical condition, has no other comorbidities, um, you know, I would I would offer it to that person because the hemodynamics are nearly normal. So, you know, you don't have gradients across the valve. And so athletic uh, athletes, you know, benefit quite well from this. And that, by the way, is the procedure that's done in athletes. So is it that not used more commonly, mainly because many adult cardiac surgeons don't include it in their repertoire? Is it surgically more complex to do than an AVR? Um, it is. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, yes, first, it's not in the usual adult cardiac surgeon's repertoire. That's true. Secondly, um, the reinforcement maneuvers have been an evolution with the procedure. There's, you know, you can put it inside a Dacron sleeve. You can reinforce the ascending aorta above it. You can reinforce the annulus below it. You can wrap the native ascending aorta around it. All of these reinforcement procedures prolong the durability of the autograft. It is a more complex operation. It's a root operation. So coronaries are detached, reimplanted. Of course, that needs to be done, you know, carefully. And then there's the pulmonary homograft insertion, um, which also, you know, adds some degree of complexity. But I should emphasize, in the hands of surgeons that do it all the time, the risk is still 1%. It's very, very low for those that do it all the time. Now, of course, the big question in today's era is, what's its role in the place of TAVR, right? The, there's yeah. such enthusiasm for percutaneous therapies. How do you see the two balancing out? When would you offer a Ross versus a TAVR in the adult population? Well, I, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that when you first look at late survival of mechanical valves versus bioprosthetic valves, and there have been many institutions that have published this data, Mayo being one, Cleveland being the other, late survival is better with the mechanical valve than it is with a bioprosthetic valve in adults from 40 to 65 years of age. and that is in the face of Coumadin and the shortcomings with Coumadin. Now, of course, the Ross procedure, their survival is even better than that. Um, so I do think that, you know, while there's a fear of Coumadin, we should remind ourselves that late survival is superior when you don't use a bioprosthetic valve. And, and, and the thinking behind why that is, is likely because with a bioprosthetic valve, you have peaks and valleys of performance of the prosthesis. So when you first put it in, you normalize hemodynamics within reason, you know, low gradient, no regurgitation. But then over time, you get a combination of one or the other. Maybe one dominates, maybe one is maybe one um, is is really quite dominating. And then the ventricle suffers the consequence. We may drag our feet a little bit before another intervention. And so then you do another intervention and maybe that's surgery, maybe that's valve and valve therapy. So I think one of the reasons why late survival with a bioprosthetic valve is lower than a mechanical valve is with a mechanical valve, you stabilize the hemodynamics that then don't change for years and decades, where with a bioprosthetic valve, it oscillates. And, mm -hmm. um, and of course, all of that is avoided with the, with the, with the Ross procedure. And, and, and that's probably why that fares even better than a mechanical valve. Oh, amazing. One last question, Joe. 
Yes. Um, for uh, those of us who follow patients who may have had a ROS operation, any pearls, tips, or tricks, things to watch for, frequency of screening? Um, so standard I echocardiogram, well, first, before they leave the hospital, they should, you know, it's been our practice here, they get an echocardiogram and they get a CT angiogram. You want to make sure that the contour of the aorta looks relatively normal. You want to make sure that the coronary ostia and buttons are normal. We don't have kinks. Um, and then um, beyond that, it's standard echocardiography for both the aortic root and the pulmonary homograph. If there are questions about the aorta or about the pulmonary arteries, I think then you follow that up with a CT angiogram. So CT angiography for great vessel anatomy, echocardiography for valve performance. Perfect. Joe, fascinating topic. Great to see these surgical advances and really more options for our patients. Uh, thanks for your time today. Thank you for your time, Paul.